I'm Scott L. Miller. This is my daily vlog of life in Leon, Nicaragua. We're not going to do a daily vlog today. We're going to be talking a little bit more about this hiring staff because a number of points came up and I think it's worth addressing some of them uh, because there's it, it's interesting and it's important. So let's dive right in and talk about more about why and why not you may want to hire staff when you come to live in Nicaragua. All right, first things up. Bill mentions, and, and Bill lives here, Bill knows his stuff, right? He lives in Messiah, he's been here a long time, so he's aware of a lot of these things. He said, I'm a bit remi amiss not discussing responsibilities such as submitting INS payments, that's your normal income tax slash social security stuff that you would have to pay in any country. Uh, you'd be used to it in the United States, for example, as just paying your taxes for having an employee. Uh, he mentions the 13-month payment, the employment agreement. So. Yes, I didn't mention these things. I don't feel I have to, but you can disagree, and he makes a good point. These are, for some reason, Americans coming to another country do have a certain tendency to think that they can just skirt the law, and when they employ someone, that they don't have to actually employ someone. That doesn't work in the United States, and it doesn't work here. If you're going to employ someone, you have to legally employ them, and that means following all the legal guidelines. I don't need to go into all those legal details because they can change, and I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an employment specialist. The real way that it works is in all cases, no matter what, no matter what country you're in, if you're going to employ people, hire a lawyer, do it properly, because there's a lot of things you need to know. That goes without saying, I would hope, but just, to be ca just in case, because Bill's concerned about it, Let's mention it. So these are some of the highlights, but just because he gives you highlights does not mean you don't need a lawyer. Lawyers are cheap, way cheaper than getting sued, and it doesn't matter because you want to do the right thing. So when we say you should hire people, I totally mean you should legally hire people, right? I think the word hire implies that, but maybe it doesn't to everyone. I never mean to break the law. I'm just saying that now, no matter what I say, if I say start a business, I don't mean do so illegally, I mean do so legally. If I say, get residency. I don't mean, you know, steal someone's passport. I mean, do it legally. <laughs> so just, I really do. I'm not implying illegal stuff here. Um, the same as you wouldn't if you're in, say, the United States or Canada. But what are some of these things? So you definitely have to pay your taxes. They're not that big. It's not a huge number, but you have to pay them and file them. You have to have an employment agreement. That's a little bit different than the United States where you can kind of work without paperwork as long as you're following other rules. Here you do have to have an employment agreement. Not a big deal. Your lawyer will whip it up for you. It'll cost you next to nothing. The 13th month thing confuses a lot of Americans because in America, we often think of salaries as annual. And here, you'd normally think of them as monthly, except that's incorrect. They think of them as lunar monthly, but they don't say it. Now, in the United States, if you said monthly, it is implied that you mean solar month. That means January, February, March, April, and so forth. So about 30 days on average, but they fluctuate, which is a really confusing thing. Some companies in the United States the first one to ever do it was Eastman Kodak, just happened to know that, uh, is they use lunar month, that is 28 days, exactly four weeks, because a year is exactly 52 weeks, you get exactly 13 of those in a year. That's a lot more powerful and, and deterministic than the month system. So it actually makes a lot of sense. And pretty much all of Latin America that I know of uses the lunar month system because it's more sensible than America's weird floating month thing. And then, to give America credit, it's because we do it based on a year and break that down by the hour or day. We never actually think of things in month terms. That's a convenient way to throw about basic numbers. We do use months for things like rent, and so that's important because you get your rent once a month, so you get a paycheck once a month, but generally you have this solid pay from the year that's spread out and you get paid every so many weeks or whatever. A lot of Americans get paid every two weeks. That's a form of lunar month payments. It's just twice a month instead of once. Make sense? Okay, so here in Latin America, almost everywhere, the standard and often the law is that you have to be paid 13 monthly payments. That's not an extra payment. That is lunar months. That is you pay every four weeks starting on January 1st, which results in an extra month in the first few days of December. So if you look at it from a bonus perspective, if you look at it from an American confused perspective, it is really easy to perceive that 13th month as an extra in December. In December, they will have gotten paid twice, sort of. That's not what's happening. It is you pay every four weeks, and after 12 four-week periods that roughly coincide with a month, 
the last one ends up kind of being like an extra payment during that month and that always falls in December. It coincides with Christmas and it feels like a Christmas bonus, but it's not. It is simply the next four weeks of payment coming up and it's the one that comes early. That is all. It is every four weeks you make a monthly payment, a lunar monthly payment. It's that simple. So once you realize when you make a deal with someone and say, I will pay you, let's say $200 a month, that does not mean 12 times 200 for $2,400 a year. It's two times 13 for $2,600 a year. And you just pay every four weeks. That's it. The thing is in many cases, Mexico, Nicaragua, lots of countries, this is required that you pay that way. And the 13th payment is expected in uh, December, which is when it would fall anyway. And it is that they negotiate based on month and they say month, they mean lunar month. That's about it. It's the habit of talking in monthly terms that throws off many North Americans who are used to talking in, in hourly or annual terms. Once you're saying monthly and you actually mean lunar monthly, that can be confusing for legitimate reasons. So that's something you need to know, but your lawyer will explain that to you. Use a lawyer. But yes, Bill has great points. Those are things you need to know. Do not try to skirt the law. Do not try to get away without doing the right things. And it's gonna protect you. And we're not talking about a lot of money here. This is not like, oh, we thought it was cheap and now it's not. No, it's still very, very cheap to do the right thing. And then your employees are real employees. You're protected. They have insurance payments. They're able to get healthcare. They're able to get social security. Everybody's happy. So do the right thing and always have a lawyer. I can't tell you how important it is to have a lawyer. You should have one in North America, but coming to another country, you always need a lawyer for things in another country. There's too many things you don't know how to do. In your own country where you grew up, yeah, there's a decent chance you could figure out all the ins and outs of the law, spend time, talk to enough people, and eventually do it without a lawyer. In theory, you don't live in your home country anymore. You need a lawyer, but even in your home country, chances are you needed a lawyer anyway. You were just taking your chances. All right. So that said, uh, there is um, a number of other points that people made. And some of this is really good, right? Like um, some people wanted to kind of, I don't want to say correct me, they weren't doing so in, in that kind of way, but they had some points about things like um, uh, uh, not everyone, not everyone, has, like, I'm a digital nomad in a way. So not everyone is a digital nomad. Uh, not everyone who's an expat coming from North America is a digital nomad. Just because I have an income from abroad doesn't mean they do. I can't just expect that they do. And my advice doesn't really take that into account. So I tried to take that into account and said people who need to save money. Um, so there's, there's two things I want to address. The first is, can you get money from abroad? And here's the answer. If you're going to move to a country like Nicaragua, you need to have a source of income. And that needs to either be a pension or retirement of some sort, at which point, if you, you we're going to discuss that, but at that point you have this fixed income coming in and the other is that you're working like me, and you don't have a fixed income, you have a non-fixed income coming in. In either case, you have money coming in from abroad and that's what you're spending here. And it could just be you know, investment, retirement investments that are bringing in the money, that's fine. It could be savings that you're eating, that's fine. But that's, that's where your source of income is coming from, not from here. Well, let's address the second thing first. The second thing is maybe you wanna get income, maybe you know someone who's making money in Nicaragua. This is not viable. Everybody asks me this. People are really passionate about thinking they're gonna to come to the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, set up a business and make lots of money. It does not work that way, right? We've covered this in another number of videos, but this isn't a daily vlog, so we're covering it again and maybe in a slightly different way. This is a very, very, very poor country. You're trying to get blood from a stone. That is the starting point. You're coming from, it doesn't matter where you come from, you're coming from a rich country to move here. Okay, maybe not if you're coming from Cuba, and we do get a few Cubans here, but in general, if you're watching my video in English, you're coming from some dramatically richer country to Nicaragua, and the last thing you should ever have on your radar is I wanna start a business and make money in Nicaragua, right? It is the last place that you wanna do work. You want to work in any of those places that you have access to. The thing that makes you powerful living in Nicaragua is your access to work and jobs in higher paying, higher employment rate countries. That is the thing you are blessed with. If you try to work somehow in Nicaragua, you are throwing away your most powerful aspect of your entire existence and taking on 
a, a situation that people are fleeing Nicaragua to get away from, which is unemployment. Those who are employed in Nicaragua on average are earning very low and the average person or about half of all people are unemployed. That is a terrible situation and is the number one thing. It is the only significant factor causing people to move out of the country. You would never voluntarily come to look at Nicaragua and say, I want to go there and take on all the need to, to support myself the way that a Nicaraguan would, because that's what we're talking about, right? Any business that you're going to run here, you're, you're competing against Nicaraguans. Those Nicaraguans have families, they have connections, they know the market, they have so many advantages over you, and they don't have these big cost items that you have, like dealing with passports and residency and, and high cost lawyers and possibly getting gringo taxed and all kinds of hoops that you either legally have to jump through or practically have to jump through because you're a foreigner trying to do business in this market. They have massive advantages over you. If your business idea had legs, a local could crush you at that same business. And if a local could do it, you can guarantee that they would be doing it if they know about it. And there's very little that they don't know about. And so if someone's not doing it, it's because nobody believes in that business or someone did and it failed, right? You can't reasonably come to Nicaragua, throw away all of your, of your advantages and think that working here is going to make you money. And first of all, you can only consider doing that realistically as a business owner. That means you're putting money into the system. You're transferring money from a foreign country. That costs money. You're transferring it into the currency. That costs money. Not huge amounts, but it's, it's, it's something. You're at a disadvantage again. And then you're starting a business in a market you don't know. After paying to relocate, everything is against you. You have so many disadvantages. It makes no sense to try to do that. And then you're going to compete against the local market. It just doesn't make sense. And you have to make your money through profits. You can't pay yourself as, a, as an employee. You're not allowed to do that realistically. That's just not something you're able to do. So you also don't have that ability. You don't have the ability to go out looking for a job. You can't do that. Sorry, I had to take a break there and come back to the video. So you don't have the option within any realistic realm of taking a job in Nicaragua. You can't be an employee here. You're stuck being an investor. And that means there's a lot of overhead, a lot of extra work. It just, it doesn't make sense. You have fewer options. If you have something, if you're in America and you try a business and you fail, you can go take a job as an employee. Here, you don't have that option. Your business, if you're going to depend on it, it has to work. You don't have that natural fallback of going to work for someone else. Of course, you can work under the table, you can do illegal things, but you're getting into a position of being, you're quite literally then stuck being an illegal immigrant trying to work under the table. You know what that's like in America. That means you're going to get paid below minimum wage. You're going to be at risk. You're always going to be in danger. Don't do that here. You wouldn't recommend it there. Certainly don't do it here, right? And you'd be taking someone's job, right? Because there are people who need that work. So it's a completely different situation. Given that, given these foundations, so are there people who are making money with businesses here? Because you'll hear these stories. I'm sure someone is, right? But there's a few factors that almost always come into it. One is that they are established for a long time, which means they probably paid their dues before the economy went bad. That means they may have stockpiled money, they may have paid off all of their debt, whatever, and now they're limping along. Very few people are making very much money, but it is potential to, there, there's this potential to, to be surviving at a lower rate than you used to be able to make, but you had to get there somehow. I have not heard any stories of anyone coming in in the last few years, investing and being able to live off of it. Some people may be able to break even. You might even make a few dollars if you're incredibly lucky. I'm not sure I've actually heard of anyone doing that in this time frame. Everyone has a story, but no one can actually produce a person, right? Tell me the person who's done this. And I've met with being a business person here. I've met with other business people who are like, I, oh, I want to sell my business. And they'll be like, I want all this money for it. And, you, and you're like, okay, show me your books. And they're not making enough to buy a hamburger each month, right? And they're working full time. They're having to keep staff supported. They're doing all these things. Their business isn't worth a thing. Some of these really successful, really su decently successful money making businesses from five years ago are now right on the verge of worthless, right? I'm not saying if someone, but 
we actually looked a business that thought their valuation would be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. We evaluated as being worth approximately $5,000. And even at that, we were wary of it, right? Because it, it would be years and years and years of almost guaranteed losses. I know people who are local and ran moderately successful, very small businesses here in Leon, and it just wasn't worth it. And they went to work in a call center in Managua, right? And these are, these are businesses that people know, businesses that are being promoted, businesses that are being kind of successful, not wildly successful, but kind of successful. It is a very tough economy and, and you're going to have a huge disadvantage. So that's, that's really important to internalize. I can't state it enough that, and, and everybody wants it to be this, this pie in the sky thing. So everyone's going to point to an example. Oh, but we've heard of people. There are people doing things illegally and making money, of course, but they're, they're taking a risk of getting caught and they're doing something illegal, which is probably not great. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, people scamming foreigners and okay, that might make money. That's also not a great business idea. Please don't come do that. Um, and there are a lot of people who are making money elsewhere while living in Nicaragua that kind of present like they're money, making money in Nicaragua. A really popular one of these is there's a lot of people who are doing things like running an Airbnb or something else and they'll run it here, but they'll actually collect the money in the United States or in Canada or somewhere abroad and they don't officially transact business in Nicaragua. I'm not saying that that's how it's supposed to work. I'm saying that this is how they're doing it. They're collecting money abroad and simply providing housing here and make, giving no direct way to connect the two. And that is a means that some people are doing to make money. Now, obviously not very much money, very small amounts of money, but that may be something that people are doing. So when you hear stories of people that say, oh, I know someone who's making money. I've heard of someone, I've met someone, something, right? Question these things. One, is it making a real amount of money or is it just not go gone out of business yet? Is the story real at all? Is it an established business? Because the only thing you care about when doing a comparison, when making a decision is other businesses that are able to start today, are they able to make money? And universally, as far as I know, the answer is no. I've heard no stories of any expat able to start a business and make money now. If you did come in and start a business now, that's fine. Please consider doing so, but do so realistically. It is not for your stream of income. Could you eventually parlay it into being a real money maker in 10 years? Very possibly. If that's your goal, I just really want to run a business and in 10 years, maybe it makes me money. Great. Come and run a business here. That would be fantastic. But if you're needing a stream of income in the near future, you're coming here and you're planning to live off your business, rethink it. 100% just stop, take it off the table. Do not, even if it's plausible, right? Even in really good markets like the United States, 85% of businesses fail. You can't just go out and start a business and be like, I'm gonna live off of this. If you could do that, people would do it everywhere. It would be so nice to go work for yourself, do your dream job and make enough money to live on. We all wish we could do that. You can't just easily do that. People who do that and are successful, that's a big deal. We get really excited. Most of us don't even know very many people who've done that, right? I know thousands of people. I only a handful of them, four or five, like literally have ever started their own business and had it make it more than a few years. In fact, off the top of my head, I know two or three people that I've, I've actually known that started their own business. One of them being me, like that, even as a person who's done this, right? I have a business that's still going after 25 years. I don't know other people who have. One of my mentors did, he sold out after 10 years, right? So yeah, he was successful, but he didn't keep doing it. He got out because he didn't know if it was gonna last and it's gone now, like all of it evaporated. So while that stuff exists, mostly it's people making money some other way, right? So, so that, and that's in America. Do that same thing here and the chances that your business is going to be successful is a lower percentage because it's a harder market and you're at a disadvantage. And just because a business is successful in the United States and keeps going doesn't mean that it makes its owners enough money to live on, right? It doesn't mean it's a stream of income. Most of the successful businesses in the United States are tax shelters. 
And so they're running either at a loss or at a, a barely making it because they, they do other functions. And that's not a bad thing, and it's not illegal, and it's not, it's not negative, but it's important to, to understand that even large numbers of American businesses that have been going for a number of years that are serving a purpose are often not a stream of income, or at least not a primary stream of income for their owners. Lots of people own businesses for other reasons, and that's great, and you can do that here too but we're talking about people who are needing a stream of income. So it is a really, really risky chance anywhere to have to live on that, to come here and base on that, you're just, you're really rolling the dice and you're needing to hit a critical roll on, on a D100, right? Um, to have any chance of living off of that at all. Bonus points for those who get the Dungeons and Dragons reference. Okay, so given all of that, um, what I also wanna talk about Right, we, we can establish just how wildly crazy this is. But then the other part of this was, well, but not everyone has this job in the United States. What are you going to do? Well, here's the thing. And I'm gonna say United States, I mean, whatever country you're coming from that has a more powerful economy than here, has more jobs that, has, that you have the right to work in. That's super important. You need the right to work. You need to figure out how to make money from that country. And it doesn't matter, so we're gonna use the US, Minimum wage in the U.S. is about seven and a half dollars, eight dollars. But realistically, very few jobs, especially those that are done online, are going to pay less than fifteen dollars an hour. So let's use that as a as a real number. At fifteen dollars an hour, if you were to work, say, ten hours a week, right, that would bring in six hundred dollars per month. That's actually enough money to live on in Nicaragua. That wouldn't be per month, that would actually be per lunar, lunar month. Go see that discussion, right? Rewind, watch that. Um, so is that a lot of money? No, it's not a lot of money. But if it's something you wouldn't be able to do if you were doing other work around the house, maybe cleaning, cooking, whatever, if you could pay someone $200 to take that load off of you so that you would feel comfortable going and working 10 hours a week, maybe they're doing you know, 30, 40, 50 hours. Of, of cleaning and cooking and just things around the house. And for whatever reason, you, you struggle and, and you need that load completely taken off of you so that you're able to work 10 hours a week. That's unlikely, it's an extreme case, but if that were true and you needed that, it would pay for itself. Of course, it lowers your income to only $400, but remember, you're only working 10 hours a week. But by Enabling it, it means you're making 400 more than you would have otherwise, right? If your alternative is working around the house and lowering your cost of living by $200, but it lowers your potential income by 400 after offset by the 200, right? This is, uh, it is tempting when looking at uh, employment and, and things like this of looking in absolute numbers. Well, I don't make enough money to hire someone to do these things for me. That is one way to look at it but it is not a useful way to look at it. What you have to look at is the alternatives. You have to look at it in relative terms. If you're able to work full time and reach your working capacity and also do everything you need to do around the house, that would be your maximum amount of income. But it is essentially impossible, not absolutely impossible, but essentially impossible for that situation to arise. Any work that you're going to be able to find abroad is going to pay many times over what most labor in Nicaragua is going to cost. And so any amount of you being able to work somewhere else pays for nearly unlimited amounts of work, not quite, but, but quite a, a large amount of work being done to enable you to do that. If anything is happening in your life, and money is what matters, that makes you feel you're unable to work more, finding a way to make that not need to be there is going to be the best way for you to make the most money in the least time, right? No one wants to work a thousand hours a week, 168 hours a week, right? You need to sleep, you need to enjoy life. You're in Nicaragua, you're here to enjoy it. We're not trying to make you work 40 hours a week, We're trying to make this make sense. So the, the numbers here, you have to really work with the math and really play with the, oh, if this enables me, any amount of this enabling me, right? Because 
cleaning your house, cooking your meals, running the errands, all of those things are a form of work, but they're work that you don't get paid for. So if you pay someone else to do it, you only have to offset the amount that you paid them, not the amount it would cost if you paid yourself. So let's run these numbers again. If you have someone who costs $200 a month to work full-time assisting you, and that enabled you to work more by not having to work that, they just unloaded a bunch of work from you. I don't know how many hours it is, but there's some amount of work that you would have been doing that now you don't have to do. I'm not saying you need to work more. That's what it sounds like, but that is not what I'm saying. I'm saying work less, work smarter, right? The Nicaraguan that you're hiring to help with your errands and to do things around the house does not have access to the US market 99.99% .99 of the time. They don't have the right to work online. They don't have the right to work in the US market. They don't have the right to get paid in a US bank account. None of those things are available to them under normal circumstances, but they are available to you. And so if you want to be able to hire the most people, do the most good for the Nicaraguans in your sphere, then taking that work abroad, bringing that money into Nicaragua, and then using it to pay people who are helping you be able to do more of that creates an ecosystem of everybody is winning in the system. You are working less than you would have if you didn't have someone helping you, but you're also earning more. Not a tremendous amount more because you have to hire someone to do the work, but you're still working less, earning more. Do less, make more. You win in this model. Right? Not everyone has this work at hand, but most everyone who's coming here has access to some kind of work like this. And then any work that they're taking off your plate is so much work you don't have to do. And they're getting a job. Right? No one's making them take the job. This is someone who came looking for a job because they need work. Right? So they're winning in this relationship as so are you. So it's symbiotic across the board. That's what I'm trying to convey is that the math under the hood really supports finding a way to work. Now, again, if you are really in a situation where, you, where the money is lean and you are already working your maximum or whatever, and there's nothing more that you can take off your plate, at some point, simply you've hit your threshold, right? And sometimes you can't find work and, and then you just have to tighten your belt. But if you're coming to Nicaragua, you need to plan around the only model that makes sense, both because you can't find work locally and because starting a business here is all but impossible from a making money standpoint. If you want to do it for residency or you want to do it for fun, absolutely come do that. But if you're doing it for a stream of income, rethink it. That is not realistically on the table. And there's the math says anything you can do to make you able to work abroad makes sense. And that's part of what makes Nicaragua so great if you're in the, United, in, in the United States, you'd need to work 40 hours, 50 hours a week, and you'd be struggling to pay your bills, and you would have to come home, and you'd have to clean on your own, you'd have to cook on your own, you'd have to run your own errands. And when do you run those errands? Because you're at work 50 hours a week, there's no time to do it, it just doesn't exist. You can solve those things here by working, you don't have to work the 50 hours anymore, because you can live here, even if you're only making $10 an hour, you can live here Right? Multiple people. You, you, this isn't a household of just one person. This could be a household of four people. If you're working at $10 an hour full time in the United States and living here, that's enough for you to hire someone to help watch the kids and cook the food and all those things and still have a way better life. That's how you have to kind of think about it. It's how you have to put this math together and put these jobs together. And I know that, that it seems hard. Well, what if I do a job that doesn't let me do that online? It doesn't matter. If you're going to come here, right? Some one way or another, you have to come up with a, a way to, to get paid. If you don't just have plenty of money, if you're independently wealthy, you don't need this conversation. But even if you are independently wealthy, even, and I don't mean you have millions of dollars. If you have enough money that you don't need to work, you're just barely getting by. Okay. That would logically say you can't hire someone, but you can because you still need to do a certain amount of work. Now, how much that is only, you know, right? How much time do you spend cooking? How much time do you spend cleaning? How much time do you spend running errands? 
How much money do you lose because you're not as effective at running those errands? And someone said, you know, if you put in time, you can stop getting gringo priced. You can all kinds of things. I don't know that I believe that, right? Somebody somewhere has managed to, to get into a situation where they're not getting gringo priced most of the time or may not be aware when they're getting gringo priced. But I know people who have lived here for a long time who are Hispanic, who speak Spanish absolutely fluently. It is their, their native language. And, and they get gringo priced because someone detects that they're not Nicaraguan. And I know Nicaraguans who grew up here, and when they come back here, because someone can detect that they lived in America for a while, they get gringo priced. Right? People who have put in their lives here, their entire adult lives spent in Nicaragua, or people who put in their entire childhoods in Nicaragua, they still get gringo priced, not all the time, but a bit of the time, enough that they tell the stories. So I don't think it's realistic to say that you, as someone coming from abroad, just have to put in some effort and, and you won't get gringo priced anymore. It's not really how it works. There is a certain amount of you will never be completely a part of Nicaraguan society and you have to accept that. You want to, in most cases, you want to try to be. You want to put in that effort. We all wish that we were more accepted. And it's not that we're ostracized. It's just we're not naturally a part of society. Right? We have to work harder at it. And there are some things that we're just never going to share. We're never going to have that shared childhood experience. We're never going to have that shared school experience. We're never going to have that this is my native language and that my accent doesn't give me away and that my, my look doesn't give me away, that my whatever, everything gives me away. And while people may be warm and welcoming and want me to participate in things, it will never be a he's Nicaraguan and just blends in. It will always be. This is someone who could pay more for a papaya. This is always someone who may need to be spoken English to. This is, I, I took a taxi today and all of a sudden I started speaking in Spanish and the, the taxi driver was like, what? <laughs> he was so confused because just seeing me, he was sure that I, obviously he knew I was foreign, but he was sure that I spoke Spanish. Or, or only spoke English, right? That I spoke Spanish really threw him off. And I know people who are born in Managua have never lived outside the country. 100% Nicaraguan, absolutely 100%, zero non-Nicaraguan. But because they don't look Nicaraguan enough, they often, or at times, get gringo taxed, right? So even Nicaraguans have it happen to them if they don't have a really strong Nicaraguan look. So I don't think that that's something you can get away from. So what I'm saying is, is that there's, even if you're, you're at substance level, there is a real chance that you could gain advantages by having someone who is helping you, maybe just part-time, maybe you don't need that much, but they're there at your home doing some things for you and that allows you to go work a little bit. And you say, well, I don't want to work. I came here so I could just retire. Okay. That, but what I'm saying is that now for some people cooking and cleaning and running errands doesn't feel like work. It's fun. But I don't really know any of those people. I know they exist theoretically in the universe. Maybe that's you. If so, great. You are blessed that that is your form of entertainment. But for normal people, there is some type of work, painting, translating, reading, uh, creative design, um, customer service, whatever that you can do and make a fair amount of money. I'm not saying a lot, I'm saying $10 an hour, few hours a week. What I'm saying is that if you do that work instead of this other work and pay someone with that money to do that work, you will likely reduce the number of hours you have to work in total while getting better value because they can do things like shop and get better prices than you can. And that's, that's really what I'm trying to say is even at that level. Of course, if you have tons of money, you're bringing in $10,000 a month, you can hire people, you don't have to think twice about it. And it's really obvious why it makes sense. Of course, you're going to do that. But I'm talking about when you are barely scraping by, you can look at this model and say, oh, I'm spending time doing these things. If I spent a little bit less time just working some job that I hopefully enjoy, I work from home then I can hire someone to do these things and be more efficient at them. And both things benefit me, earn more, do less, get more value. That's what I'm trying to say is that, that there are exceptions to this, but I don't think they are nearly as many as people think they are going to be. 
take almost any person and you will find that there's a way that working remotely, and that's the hardest part is finding the job, but once you find it, right, get out there, find that stream of income, bring it with you. You don't need very much here. Everything is so much cheaper than, than you're used to. Like it's mind blowing, but you gotta have some way to bring in that money from the outside and anything you can do to shift any work you're doing to the outside, the more it's gonna benefit you and benefit everyone. Very different topic than we normally do. I hope this is useful. I wanna see people get in the comments, ask your questions. I know there's gonna be a lot of like, how does this math actually work? How do, or, seriously? But really, like this is treating yourself like a business. And this is a thing that I teach to businesses is that often people excuse their personal lives as, well, it's my personal life, it's not a business. And I think that's a real bad way to look at it. There are important things in your personal life that you have to realize are emotional and not business. So maybe you choose an iPhone over an Android and it costs more, but it makes you happy. Put a dollar sign on that. Does it cost $300 more? Does it make you $300 happy? More happy, easily. In which case, it's a great business decision. But we've made it a business decision by putting a dollar sign on the level of happiness it provides for you. And if afterwards you spend less and you're like, well, I'm not happy, well, then you misjudged your happy dollars. You need to fix that. These are things that you can do. We just had an earthquake at Las Piedras Rivas right as I'm talking. So if, uh, but it's a small one. I don't think anyone's going to have too big of an issue. It's a 4.8, but we do get the alerts because we live in Terremoto country. Uh, but learning to do that, learning to treat how you, what you do at home like a business, but with this need for applying this emotional, uh, illogical satisfaction on top of normal business logic. Yes, it adds a little bit of a challenge, but you need to think of your personal life like a business. And in doing so, it gives you the power to figure out how to get more value out of life and evaluate things in a much better way. Purely going with, with no decision-making process and saying it's my personal life, I should not be held to any standard, is just a way of saying, I'm gonna make bad decisions, I know I'm gonna make bad decisions and you can't tell me I shouldn't. And I can't tell you that you shouldn't. Well, I am. You shouldn't make bad decisions. It's a bad idea. You're gonna lose at the end of the day. We all know that bad decisions are bad decisions for a reason. Don't excuse them. This is just a general life happiness thing. At the end of the day, if you make good decisions, you'll be happier with yourself afterwards. When you make a bad decision and it ruins something in your life, ah, you know, I, I knew I should have not driven so fast, but I lost control and I hit that tree and now I have to replace my car. You know that if you'd not driven that extra bit faster, sure, you'd have been like, ah, I wanted to drive faster. I don't feel as happy, but you know the alternative is being super un upset because you trashed your car. That's what we're trying to avoid. Make good life decisions using logic and apply your emotional needs to it. You'll be happier. Personal lives are like business. Don't let people try to talk you out of that. That Anyone who's trying to talk you out of that is probably a salesperson with something they're trying to get you to do or buy from them or some lifestyle they're trying to push. That's why people tell you those things, right? It's kind of like in the industrial revolution, they tried to sell everyone on working lots of hours. That's satisfaction. That's your value. That's what makes you a good human. What? That's crazy. Why is just showing up and working for the man considered the thing that gives you value in life? That was something they made up during the Industrial Revolution, and we need to get over that. That's something they've drilled into us, but it makes no sense. That is not how we find emotional satisfaction. Our satisfaction comes from being happy, taking care of people, raising a family, living in a beautiful country, having a good beer, eating delicious food. Those are the things that actually give value to life, not showing up and working really hard so someone else can maybe make more money all to turn out things probably no one needs anyway and may actually be detrimental to society. Thanks for joining me. Please remember to like and subscribe. I'll see you all tomorrow.